welcome friends uh, uh, apologies for uh, being late today there were some technical issues uh, today we have got a very 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 special guest um, she uh, broke Bobby Fisher's record by uh, becoming uh, youngest grandmaster in the year 1991 uh, she is the strongest women player uh, the world has ever produced she won uh, the chess Oscar eight times she has defeated uh, 11 world champions in various formats. Uh, she was uh, in world top 10. She was world number 8 once upon a time. Uh, she is clearly the best player and her playing style, her attacking style is respected by, uh, by all the top players. She also won the European Individual Championship and World Youth in open category, which no other women ever did. Let us, let's welcome none other than Judith Polgo. Hello, Judith. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Th thanks a lot, uh, Judith, for coming here. Uh, for coming to my Happy channel. And uh, yeah, first of all, a uh, confession, huge fan of yours, like uh, from childhood. Thank so, you very much. So uh, I'll directly get into, uh, get into uh, how you started playing uh, chess. So, in your childhood, th these pictures are taken from uh, from your fantastic uh, trilogy books uh, that uh, I have, and uh, so we see here uh, from the very uh, beginning you are uh, inclined to solve studies, and uh, there are lots of uh, materials. Back then, there were no computers, so uh, as you mentioned in your book, uh, everything was uh, basically handwritten. If you could tell us a bit, uh, you know, how things started and what I would like to know is, uh, what is it that makes you so different? Like uh, in the history, no, no women could achieve uh, what you achieved. What, what, how do you get this kind of mental strength? Uh, generally speaking, I think uh, obviously it comes from my family background. Mm -hmm. that uh, my parents are both teachers and my father before actually he met my mom he had an idea that he he's not happy with the educational system mm -hmm. and he wants uh, his kids to be specialized on one special field whether it's music it's medicine it's uh, chess or anything else it doesn't make a difference for him he believed that uh, this is the best way you can give happiness and security success and the, the best you can for your child right then he met my mom uh, my mom at first of course was very curious about this man but later on they got married they had uh, susan as a first child and uh, she was about four years old when she was extremely good in math extremely good already in chess and uh, so already that time my father thought okay it's time to decide which direction she's going to be moving uh -huh. and uh, I think also partly influenced by Fisher Spassky in those times it was Susan was like three and a half at the time and so they went on the on the chess uh, area so this is the path that started I think my career as well and then later on a few years later five years later Sophia was born and she was playing chess already when I started to play chess uh -huh. And uh, this is how it all started. So I ended up uh, growing up in a family where the kids were in the center of attention, where the parents decided to make so-called an experiment, but uh, I like to say it more that they designed and discovered a completely unusual lifestyle for us. And uh, they also believed that as girls, we can achieve the same results as uh, any other milk competitor. And I think this mindset gave me the opportunity to to reach the heights which I did. Uh, but how did you have this particular mindset from the very beginning that you can beat uh, the boys? Like you you started defeating, uh, you started winning in open category from very early age. Uh, was it very diff like? Did you do any special mental training for this? That yes, I can win in the open category also. I think we tend to underestimate small details and I think small details can make the biggest differences. And this was in my family that my parents believed in me being able to reach. They were not even uh, 
uh, skeptical about it, that they were always believing and saying that if you work hard, if you do uh, your trainings and we go to tournaments and you do your homework, then uh, your way is there, you're going to be on the top. And by saying this, and uh, so it was by, uh, what, by nine, ten years old when I was uh, playing in competitions, it was very clear front of my eyes that my road is ahead going to the very best male players. And I think this uh, seems to be maybe a very small detail, but it makes a huge difference how you can uh, develop and uh, unfold your potentials. If your uh, loved ones, your teachers, coaches, and people surround you, they really put their expectation on a very high level, and you also get all the maximum support in trainings and, and in everything, then uh, it makes a huge difference. So it is very hard to say when uh, people also ask me, well, can you suggest some good advices for girls? How should mm -hmm. they do it? Exactly, exactly. It's very, but it's very painful for me that in some ways it might be late or it might be, it might be very different. So from this point of view, I think I'm the most fortunate that my parents really believed in my potentials as a, as a girl, as a human being to reach the highest. And this is essential where you're starting uh, out from. Right. Uh, we are seeing this picture on your uh, on, on, on our right side of the screen where there are a lot of uh, magnetic chess sets, right? And uh, I read in the book and it's quite well known that uh, you were inclined to solve a lot of studies. Uh, how was it like uh, initially? Like how many positions would you solve a day when, you know, uh, when you were, let's say, 10 years old or 14 years old, let's say? Well, by the time I was 14, we are not go uh, we were not using this uh, board on the wall anymore. But right. when I was six, seven, eight years old, 10 years old, mm -hmm. up to age uh, about 10, 11, we were still living in that very small apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main idea was that, uh, of course, nowadays you go on the computer and days is you just enter one of the websites and then you do puzzle rush, you do all kind of thematic uh, mm -hmm. solvings, right? Right. In those days, we did not have this. So what we had is every day when we had a teacher to come, when he was leaving, he was setting up 30 positions. This so well, this is tricky because it's not the, yeah, not exactly action yet. It's just the, the imagination. Yeah, yeah. No, prob probably I'll just, uh, I'd rather just uh, show the, show how it went. So you played uh, King H4 here, and already you saw the trick. I, I, I assume you first saw Rook takes F7, and then probably this is a draw, right? Uh, I think so, yes, but I discovered that there is a mate. understand uh, your idea. Uh, yes, it, uh, it is the case. There were uh, quite a lot of uh, occasions when I could manage uh, my so-called tricks right. or tactical vision, uh, implementing it in a chess game, which mm -hmm. obviously was much easier to do when I was uh, smaller and playing with, uh, with lower level players, especially when they didn't know me yet. Right. And, uh, of course, these kind of tactical beauties, uh, you can't uh, do too much on a higher level. First of all, they notice it. Secondly, they don't allow me to go all the way until the checkmate. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely so. And uh... But this is one of, one of an example which I was most uh, proud of. I remember 89, uh, where we were playing, I was really happy with this. Abs Everything was matching perfectly. Absolutely, absolutely. The second one is also very pretty. Like uh, I selected few positions where uh, it is not exactly expected that the game will end so quickly, and uh, like the, the tactics comes literally out of nowhere. Uh, this was not against Hansen. This was against uh, uh, yeah, Yil yes. Yilmaz, Yilmaz, Yilmaz Mustafa. Uh, it was in Armenia, two thousand fourteen. So we'll talk yeah. about yeah. Go on. You go ahead. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, this is also from your fantastic book. We'll we'll talk about the book as well. Uh, did you did you plan these tactics also ahead in advance? 
Uh, to be honest, I don't remember now exactly when was the moment I realized. I think his last move was Queen G4, wasn't it? No, Queen G4, Queen E1, and now he made the Rook move, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, he moved the Rook. That was his last move. And I think when I played Rook E1, I realized it, that uh, that I have this uh, option, mm -hmm. because I was continuously checking whether Rook F3 works. Right. And... Uh, and somehow it is very difficult to explain uh, what is the process in our mind, right? Correct. That uh, how do we really find these tactical things? And Because most of the time it's in chess, it's not like that, that you can plan it, that I go here, then I go there, and then what I trap the queen. Things are happening on the way, right? So black mm -hmm. is making moves as well. Uh, and... Uh, I was very much amazed during the game that it's like such a rare opportunity and it comes really from sky, thunder from the sky. And uh, I was, you know, when, when you see something exceptional during the game and then, uh, then you're excited inside, of course you don't show it to your opponent, mm -hmm. but you're very excited. And uh, I remember I was very much amazed because it's a very unusual uh, trap of Queen. Absolutely, absolutely so. Uh, would you say that, uh, you know, from your childhood, uh, solving so many studies had a lot of impact, like solving so many positions? So you, you generally spot such tactics remar at remarkable speed. Absolutely. I think it's no question about it that solving puzzles and problems and, and uh, studies, it gives in quantity, in quantity. Yeah. It, uh, it gives you extremely big stability and that uh, even when you're sleeping and they wake you up, you can point out uh, a few uh, positions, your favorites. But also what helped me a lot that I was playing a lot of blitz games with my sisters. Right. On a daily basis, we played at least uh, 10, 15, 20 games, the least. And also what uh, the training uh, contained that we were playing blindfolded. Right. I think it also gives a great uh, training for uh, for visualizing all these tactical things. Right. Uh, Judith, I would like to point out uh, to the audience also that uh, this position occurred uh, just a few weeks back uh, in Kramnik versus Carlsen from the Legends tournament. And both of them were playing on seconds. And uh, Judith, you were commenting along with Grishchuk, Rustam Kazimzanov and Gustafsson. And uh, I, I was watching it live and before anybody could even understand what was going on, you spotted in fraction of second what is the uh, drawing method. That was very impressive. Like, and I could also see the enjoyment in your eyes. Like when you spot such a tactics, you were like immediately you appreciate the beauty. Uh, this yes, I think this this uh, reflects my play also for many years i was uh, somehow the priority was uh, was always the beauty and the tactical uh, exceptional uh, patterns which i could produce in my games but uh, here it is typically exactly a very good example because i was solving a lot of studies it it was natural for me to spot it out yeah so cannot take and wherever it moves and next move, we just take the pawn and then king is wrong color. Uh, in the game, yeah. Kramnik uh, didn't play it. Although he made a draw, he was actually losing this game. But okay, they were playing And he also second. loves studies, actually. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? He also loves studies. He loves studies. Yeah, yeah, he loves studies. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah he loves studies. Yeah. But of course, it's a different story to spot it out while uh, making a commentary and spot it out during the game when you have so many things happening emotionally and uh, chess-wise. But, uh, yeah, these things can simply happen in a game. Right, right. Uh, by the way, uh, talking about emotion, uh, uh, do you think this emotion plays a lot of role in a game of chess? And uh, one should master how to control their emotion? Uh, absolutely, I believe psychology is, is part of the game. It's a big part of the game. Of course, uh, I believe it's differently part of the game as uh, when it was 20 years ago. Right. I mean, it's part, partly in the opening preparation, what kind of opening you choose against your opponent, what kind of mindset, what kind of tournament situation there is. 
and uh, so there there is a lot of emotional part also before the game during the game and also of course after the game during the tournament how you're handling a loss how do you handle a blunder how do you handle a a victory, for example, I had an amazing victory against Anand in 1999. Yes. Dos Hermanas, which Ru was one of the most beautiful game of my life. Rook it was game Rook D6, one. Rook D6, yeah? This Rook D6, you provoke F6, that game, yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, Sicilian uh, and it's very sharp. I sacrificed a few piece and right. it was a huge attack. I won that game and I was so excited. And that I didn't win a single game afterwards in a tournament. Of course, it's a very, it was a very tough and strong tournament. But still, I remember that emotionally I was so hyped up that that I was like kind of I did my job in the tournament or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so sometimes, of course, it goes on on good or bad ways also psychologically. Sure, sure. Uh, Judith, you defeated. 11 world champions in various formats. I think Kasparov you defeated in Rapid, Kramnik you defeated in Blitz, but all others you defeated in uh, classical format. And you also won a yeah. match against uh, Spassky and Smyslov as well. And Smyslov also, uh, I didn't play a match, but against Spassky Asp I did a very, yeah. very interesting match. Yeah, that was a very interesting match. Ah, uh, Smyslov, I just remember this Berlin game where you outplay him from a Rook end game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Smyslov, by the way, Smyslov is also the one who complimented you by saying you are like Mikhail Tal in skirt, yeah? Yes. <laughs> how, how did it yes. feel like when such compliments come from a, such a legend who saw Mikhail Tal so closely and then comparing you with Mikhail Tal? It was, uh, it was very nice. I remember even where he said it personally when we were playing in Aruba in the, in the ladies against the veterans uh, battles. Mm -hmm. which was annually organized and there on the beach he was telling this to when my parents were sitting there and uh, they were talking in Russian it, it it's very nice of course it's one of the the nicest compliments uh, I've ever got right right uh, for those who has not seen uh, in YouTube there is a very nice TED talk where uh, Judith speaks about how she defeated Kasparov so I'm not touching that topic because I personally find it uh, very inspiring so you guys can check uh, that one. Uh, Judith, you, uh, I would like to ask more about, uh, let's say, Spassky and Karpov, your match with Spassky. How was it? Because you are, you are a lot younger and you are playing a, such a legend. If you could talk. This to match was mm -hmm. taking place in 93, just a few months after the rematch between Fisher and Spassky. Mm -hmm. So actually Spassky was, of course, but he was pretty well prepared and mentally very much into the game. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it came very quickly as the sponsor. Uh, it was the same sponsor, mm -hmm. and uh, it was about ten days before the match started that uh, we got to know that uh, it will happen. So I called my uh, trainer at the time, Sahis. Uh, he always tells me the story how funny it was, and I told him, "Well, I'm playing against Paski. Can you help uh, and come over to Budapest?" So the next flight, he was sitting and coming over and it was an uh, amazing journey for me the location we had in in a ballroom of one of the most uh, <clears throat> nicest hotel in budapest on the danube uh, bank and uh, we had about daily a thousand people watching the game it was still the classical way of having on the the demo board where yes. humans were setting the voices where it was still allowed that the audience has their own little pocket chess set and they are looking at it, following that. And uh, every day we had uh, one game and uh, it was so exciting. Uh, somehow it was such a great match, uh, excitement in the game with Boris's style as he was also uh, always... Uh, uh, he was looking for interesting ideas. He was never... Uh, avoiding uh, things that uh, he, he was not going so much that he has to be so solid right he right. played his Berlin, uh, player system where uh, i uh, i had a fantastic idea by lev and i mm -hmm. uh, actually there was one game that it was almost preparation fully out of opening but i had even the draws uh, i made some magical knight uh, moves there with black i played i think it was game uh, i don't know it was game 
two or game one where it was a close to Rai Lopez. Right. So I won in, in different ways. Also, I had actually a nice uh, queen trap in game three, I think, which, mm -hmm. which was also kind of very unusual. And uh, so from different angles, it was one of the most memorable uh, 10 days of my life because uh, it was something very, very interesting and uh, challenging. Right. So uh, from Spassky, uh, then at some point you met uh, the person whose record you broke. And who, to be honest, probably before meeting you, he had very low opinion about uh, general strength of women players. How was your experience? I know Fischer stayed for a long time with uh, in Hungary. Also, uh, when I visited Peter in uh, in Saged, uh, he told me uh, Bob uh, Fischer was uh, Fischer stayed with him for quite a long time. How was your experience with uh, Fischer? Uh, I was like 16 years old, almost 17, when uh, I met him for the first time. This was still at the border in uh, one uh, small uh, part, small mm -hmm. city, uh, where he was staying after the match. Mm -hmm. And we were visiting together with my parents and Sophia. Susan was not there at the first meeting. And uh, it was kind of, uh, well, of course, it was very emotional to, to meet a legend like uh, Bobby Fischer, Nobody is like him, right? For mm -hmm. many reasons. And then uh, somehow my father convinced him that Hungary is a great place. We have great food. We have thermal bus. We have a beautiful city. And anyway, what is he doing there in a boring, boring uh, city? And then uh, just a few weeks time, he moved to Hungary and he was a free almost daily basis visiting our home. Uh, so it was amazing and it was beautiful, but which was very fortunate that he did not want to play regular chess. He was more focusing on uh, random. on the prearranged game. Well, also the prearranged game. He mm. was uh, explaining in details his theories, uh, how things were, and of course, I think most of the people know how sick mind he had yeah. uh, in many perspective, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, he was very, very uh, cheerful. He was in some ways, of course, childish also, I must say. He loved animal, you can see on the picture. He ah, loved yes. the cat. This is a summer house, actually, and you see in the background also but Eugene This is Tore, Eugene Tore, yeah, 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 I was going to ask. That's Eugene Tore, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And uh, so he loved food, he, he ate, uh, incredible quantity he was trying to be funny all the time but in between his uh, his uh, funny things innocent jokes there were some very heavy painful things also right, so right. Uh, of course it colored my life quite a bit but i have uh, controversial uh, memories uh, with him sure. so it was very hard uh, the way he was explaining things in a in a in a smiley environment, the way he was doing it, it was you couldn't take him seriously. But on the other hand, the things he was saying and and accusing people with, mm -hmm. it is it is really something uh, you can't accept. Uh, correct, correct. Not even a bit. So it's uh, it's controversial. But of course, he was. We played a few games in Fisher Random. Of course, he was saying it all the time that Fisher Random is the future, mm -hmm. and this is how everything should be because uh, the opening theory is killed already. Right. And uh, so, uh, you are often called as the lioness for your strength. And uh, I saw this uh, this magazine. By the way, this came in two thousand four. It was a special fan moment for me also. First of all, I liked, I love this picture. And secondly, uh, this is also the year when I won my first Indian championship. So it was also covered uh, in that magazine. And in general, I saw there are so many pictures with uh, you and Lion and then Cheetah and also all sorts of wildlife. Yeah, you are swimming with dolphin. There is some crocodile. Uh, so what is it like your fascination with uh, wildlife? We probably have to t talk about Gustav also in this regard. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I just like the animal. I remember when I was little, what you see on the right hand side, the picture, I was about 14 years old. Mm -hmm. I remember in those times, uh, I loved chimpanzees a lot. Right. And I don't know why I had this fascination to animals, but I... Uh, 
I was always looking for opportunities where I can uh, meet them in uh, in more natural way. Uh, so I just uh, felt uh, felt very comfortable near them. Uh, uh, and the picture, yeah, yeah, the picture you see that on the on the board, it is actually in my workroom at the time. Both pictures on the new in chess cover and next to it also. The, yeah, my husband is a veterinarian and he's working with exotic animals as well. Mm -hmm. And time to time he was bringing home uh, uh, lions, sometimes uh, other animals also. So that's, that's when those pictures were uh, taking place. Yeah. Uh, so there was this uh, moment when uh, uh, Anand was traveling from, uh, from Germany to Sofia. Uh, due to this volcanic uh, eruption, we were traveling by road and uh, we had to cross uh, different countries and uh, Hungary was uh, one of them. So we stayed in a hotel and uh, at this point Rustam said uh, he would pay a visit to you. Like uh, I think he, he went and uh, visited you and then we were talking in general and at some point uh, Rustam was telling if you go to Jurid's house, uh, you, you know, you can meet all sorts of animals and he said something about some snake story also. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's a story. Well, I I'm not a big fan of snakes. Mm -hmm. They they their PR is not good, it seems. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my husband has different treatments on on snakes also, and uh, well, sometimes uh, if he's uh, very much not aware of what kind of snake it is, and actually once he had an experience that. Uh, he was treating a snake, and then the day after, or a few days after, on the television, it uh, it was uh, announcing that it bit the the owner, and the owner died, I think. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, he decided a special technique on uh, uh, when the snake comes in, he sends out the, the owner, and it says special treatment is going to be done, and then he puts the or in some cases he puts it uh, the snake into the fridge because it has this special reaction of a snake that if it's cold, then it uh, fro frozes, mm -hmm. so it cannot move. So he can make the treatment and after that, <laughs> give, give it back. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I know yeah. many people like this <laughs> yeah. treatment. Actually, uh, talking about books, so we were talking about uh, your, uh, the hard work and, uh, you know, the amount of positions you solved. You know, recently I was reading a book. It's called Bounce. Have you read this book, Bounce? Uh, no, but I I've heard of it. There is I know the book. there is there is a chapter on uh, Polgar sisters. There is a whole chapter on Polgar sisters, and mm -hmm. they, so uh, so talking about books, uh, three three books that you wrote. Uh, first of all, I would I would uh, suggest. Uh, all the viewers to to get every single book i read i read all of them and it's fascinating uh there there are many things i can talk about the these three books judith but you know what uh, what impressed me the most is that when someone is writing a book they usually tend to write only their good games and the games which they won but i saw in these books you have also given the games that you lost like for instance with shirov where shirov uh, uh played this uh, beautiful bishop h5, knight d5, and uh, mates you. And there is this Kasparov game. Uh, so what I love the most is like your appreciation of chess beauty is so at such a high level that you did not even mind giving your loss games. It was... Uh, it was... Uh, well, for me, this was a very special journey to... to... To look at back on my career because actually it was uh, by chance that uh, by finishing my third volume it clashed actually with the with the time when uh, I retired from competitive chess mm -hmm. so I could still include this game uh, with with the queen trap <laughs> right. one of my last tournaments I played right and um, well for me it was very interesting to write it I had a helper a very good old friend of mine uh, Mihail Marin Mm -hmm. And uh, I was collecting my diaries. I was collecting my. I was writing everything down. I was ke kept uh, all my score sheets from the very beginning of my career. So I was taking all those games. I was entering into my database, 
And uh, looking back, many of them, how I developed with the years and also the training games I played with different coaches. So I wanted to make something out of the three volumes that, uh, first of all, really to show some of the examples of my very earliest years, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to have that I'm a grandmaster and I just give the best games. Right. Because we shouldn't forget that all of us, no matter how high we reach, we were once a beginner and we were once making a lot of mistakes, even though if we won the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also felt it how the years were passing. My games were more complete and it had uh, less and less ideas. And I'm, I think, I'm not sure I made the best selection, but I'm uh, very spoiled. I spoiled myself having a lot of interesting uh, games. And I think I could, uh, I have many different games, which now I think that I may have been included. But even this way, it's more than a thousand pages. But it was a long journey for me. Uh, it is very clear that it's, it's kind of a work of my life, what I produced on the chessboard. I wanted and I tried to put it in a, in a context where uh, new talents, uh, they can also learn from it, not only appreciate the, the beauty of chess. And I think uh, losses and draws uh, can be at least as interesting. And obviously, you can learn from them uh, quite a bit. So for me, it was quite natural. It's it's if I would have more series, obviously I will have uh, I would have more losses <laughs> included. No, but also like the games you have included, it's not not necessarily all the full games. But uh, what I really liked was uh, some particular moments. And there are so many games which we simply cannot see otherwise. These games were not available in database. So that is also another thing that I appreciate about this book. Like uh, otherwise, we would mm -hmm. simply never know about uh, such games at all. So really, thank thanks so for I'm, doing this. I, yeah, I'm happy to that I could share also some of the games which were not public yet. So th those are uh, nice. In other hand, it was a huge challenge that how to write a book that uh, I'm also sharing the quality and the. Uh, and uh, the knowledge and the experience I had on the highest level, at the same time not to go on a too high level. So it is obviously it's extremely difficult to keep the balance. I guess the first book is uh, is more for uh, for uh, amateur players as well as it's not so complicated mm -hmm. the games yet. Right, right. Uh, talking about this book, I have picked few positions from this book. This is one of my favorite. Uh, this is. Uh, I mean, uh, looking at this position, uh, who would imagine like in like another nine moves, game is over and black is uh, winning? Well, this is a very special uh, memory for me as well. This was played in 1994, Buenos Aires, in a special the only tournament I've ever played, which was a theme tournament, and it was a Sicilian theme tournament, so mm -hmm. I was very happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. and this position was actually played just a few weeks before this uh, tournament took place between Shirov and Kasparov, right. where Kasparov played knight a5 and got a little worse position. Mm -hmm. And I knew exactly with Shirov we had the countless uh, games, <clears throat> which was incredibly <clears throat> interesting, I think. I could write a full book about only sure. the games and the experiences with uh, Alex uh, Sander, mm -hmm. Alexei. And uh, so what I did, actually, there was a free day just before this game, and mm -hmm. I was looking and preparing. And I prepared this, uh, this uh, pawn sacrifices and these tactical things, mm -hmm. which uh, is exceptional that everything somehow matches. And uh, it's not a very... The, my next move is, is not something uh, exceptional, but the move uh, in three moves time, yeah. I think uh, it works. Yeah, okay. This is, this is very thematic. Uh, also, Kasparov played this number of times. Uh, like, not in this position, but this particular theme. Yeah, the general idea to have the knight on e5 is, uh, is very clear that it's incredible power in such a position. Yeah, but the real move Therefore, comes actually now. This is something that I have not seen before, I mean, prior to this game. 
Yeah, and I, actually, I haven't seen this, this kind uh, ever since. But something sometimes <clears throat> things happen, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. White Queen on G two is kind of in the pin. The B seven Bishop is very powerful. White also in castle yet. The White Queen controlling too many important squares. So, but uh, yeah, it's uh, what what a move. And if G eight six, you would just take yeah or. Yeah. Yes, yes, I have to take, I think, that. Yeah. And trying to look for compensation on the black squares. Right. Shirov, uh, being very aggressive player himself, he accepted the challenge. And I think he might have missed your... Uh, this move, like the move you made now. Uh, yes, but actually he was not upset at all at this point. And after his next move... He knew that he cannot take the g5 because knight f3, knight g5, and the bishop 7 bishop is still keeping the pin. Mm -hmm. But this time the a1 rook is under the pin. So he played knight a5. And, and it was a huge hole where he made the move. He was kind of happy that, okay, so now I'm in safe. <laughs> so now, now there are like three pieces hanging and everything looks under control for white. Yeah, 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 kind of. And, uh, and my next move that was also making my heart beat faster my goodness this is and this would have i mean okay of course this would have not happened in the game but it's such a picturized position yeah i like yes. the knights they yeah. they give a lot of surprises in different kind of positions and if take then takes and now again mate is threatened so yeah and there is now there is literally nothing to do and you won the game yeah, the small detail was still important B3. to play B3. B3, so B3 was rescue, very important. Rescue, yeah, rescue the A1 knight. Yeah, because otherwise, yeah, sure. <clears throat> and I think generally in, in these kind of games, it also somehow back in my mind, it's it's uh, when you see a study, you know that everything is just standing on the right square. So when you have a game like this, you're not surprised that you have to have simply the only move maybe but it's it go it uh, it makes you win the game, right? Exactly. So here also everything just everything was in time in the right place with the final touch with B three. Exactly, it started from like from G five, like every single move it made. Uh, it was just matter of one demo. Like you have to have ninety three here, and then also, yeah, just in time to get B three. If the pawn is on B five, then already this whole combination might not have worked. Yeah. <clears throat> the next one, uh, this is actually uh, memorable for me also personally. Uh, this is the first time uh, I saw you playing live. And I remember mm -hmm. uh, one particular game uh, which created a huge impression on me. That was uh, your game with Smirin. Uh, you take rook takes mm -hmm. h5 at some point and go queen d5, queen h5. And actually this brings back to uh, before we see the game, I would also like to talk about one more thing. Uh, so this is the, as I said, this is the first time I, uh, I saw you playing and I noticed one thing, you sit, uh, with folded legs. I mean, at least back then you were, uh, while playing, you used to sit with folded legs. Now this is something not, uh, if I may say so, not all, uh, Europeans can actually do this. Uh, <laughs> and, and only after reading your books, I realized that how uh you know fit you were at some point like you were doing uh, this kickboxing you're playing badminton table tennis i saw some pictures of uh, yoga also uh if you could tell about uh, your fitness like uh, when you were uh younger what sort of sport you did or exercise uh, i did different exercises <laughs> table tennis was one of the first i did when i was about 10 years old that i was also competitively doing at the same time playing, competing in a few events. I had to do a daily training of like two hours when I was in uh, at home. Mm -hmm. Then later on, I played the uh, big tennis uh, quite a bit. Then I was doing kickboxing for a short time. Mm -hmm. I liked swimming. I did aerobics. <coughs> During the tournament, usually I made my uh, exercises an hour more or less a day. And uh, the picture, what you see in the in the middle, the way I was sitting, uh, mm -hmm. my legs folded, 
it was uh, only now, you know, just a few months ago that I uh, I made some connection. How did this happen? My uh, to become for me natural to sit this way. First mm -hmm. of all, I was very flexible. Okay, that <laughs> that helped. But uh, as I'm writing a book for kids and it's going to be published in October for beginners and I, I try to say some also little stories about myself and then I was going back in time and I realized that in 1988 when I was playing together with my sisters mm -hmm. representing Hungary for the first time mm -hmm. on the stage I was uh, I was shaking my head my leg mm -hmm. I was playing on board too and I played incredibly well I won 12 games and one draw so Susan and Madel and Sophia, they always said that how great that you play on board too, because you win every game. And, uh, but I was shaking with my, my leg. And it was at one point, uh, they told me that, well, this is great that you win the games, but maybe you can stop shaking your leg because the whole stage is shaking. <laughs> and I think it was after that, that I figured out that I cannot be so rude to others that I I I made so, make such an impact during the game and the whole stage is shaking, and I think after that I started to fold my leg to 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 make comfortable for everybody and uh, don't disturb others. <laughs> uh, so I think somewhere there uh, end of the year uh, when I was 12, 13, that's when I started it, and uh, and somehow I felt also uh, in a much better concentration right. when I was sitting that. Right. <clears throat> now, getting back to this uh, this beautiful game. Uh, okay, so the first two moves are actually pretty uh, direct and obvious. So you check and take g6. It looks like black is doing absolutely fine. The king is uh, hiding here. This bishop is strong. Uh, Judith, when you played your next move, did you see until the end? Um... Uh, this I don't remember to be honest. Um, I don't know <coughs> if I did. Maybe, maybe I did because it's pretty forced. But I remember again the similar story. Then uh, it happened with Shirov that when Shirov went after knight a5 away, and I made my move knight e3, and from distance he was looking back that what what kind of move I played. And this is exactly happened with Pressine after g6 he went to the bathroom. I mean, you know, these typical uh, emotional moments when you feel, okay, now everything is okay, everything is under control, I go to the bathroom, I wash my face, whatever. And then he was, when he was coming back, he saw my next move and he was like, looking, 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 what? What, what is this move? What is this nonsense? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's how it looks, right? It's completely against uh, all uh, principles what we learn when we are kids uh, in, in, uh, in chess. But actually, I must say that this Olympiad was one of the most memorable for me, even though only in the last second I realized that we are not going to win any medal. Right. I had uh, right. five or six beautiful games, and this is also one of the most exceptional uh, victory of mine. Wait, uh, because everything wait. was, again, so detailed. I just remember that uh, Istanbul, okay, I also played uh, for India, and India played with Hungary because I, I think I took rest, but couldn't they defeat at Almasi? You you did not play that day, yeah? Probably Maybe. You play, probably you took rest. Probably yeah. you did not play, yeah. Because there was Sashi versus Leko and uh, Abhijit mm -hmm. uh, played Almasi. Yeah, I think third board you were, you took. I think I didn't play. Yeah. Though I played, I think, 12 for 13 games. Yeah. By the way, talking about Olympia Judith, uh, I was simply not aware. When we scheduled everything, I was not aware. Like the Olympiad schedule was not out. So I did not know that India was uh, India's uh, game will be starting exactly at the time when we are having this interview. But by then it came, everything was uh -huh. yeah. So right now, right now as we are talking uh, uh, with it, Prague and uh, everyone there, uh, I don't know if Hari is playing or uh, Anand is playing today. Uh, they are uh, they are actually uh, playing in the online Olympiad. Fighting there. Okay. Fighting, yeah, they are fighting. Good luck to them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's see the game. So you you made a very unusual move, if I may say so, that is uh, pinning your queen. But basically, okay, coming for this pawn. And yes, it's very unnatural, but 
the, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that the rook on f4 and the h8 after queen e5 can be double attacked. Right, right. And the main idea is actually that not to allow king g7. So it's, uh, there are some things in chess positions, right? That if black goes king, g, king g7, it's me who can be in trouble. So you have to do something mm -hmm. against uh, queen c5. Right, right. Uh, by... Against something like king g7, sorry. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, by the way, I see, meanwhile, uh, in the chat, they updated that India defeated uh, Indonesia and Anand and Hari uh, are playing against... Uh, Iran. Okay, good, good. Good luck. And I, I really hope that India finishes at top. Uh, so there is this qualifying uh, preliminary stage. So if they finish on top, they, then they don't have to play a certain match and they can get uh, mm -hmm. directly at the, at the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. all right. So in this... Well, your team is always very amazing and uh, the talents you have in India. Yeah, uh, well, talking about uh, that, I know recently you met uh, one of our uh, young Indian players, Ronak Sadwani. He was in, he got stuck in Budapest. And uh, yeah, Leon. Yeah, yeah, Leon. Oh, no, sorry, not Ronak. Yeah, you met Leon, Leon Mendekna. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you met Leon. And uh, uh, and from there also, I got to know you, you actually love uh, Indian food nowadays and you can also cook Indian food. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, that's true. It's Yes, and uh, I was in Kerala area in uh, in February on an Ayurvedic treatment, and ever since I started to go on courses, cooking courses, and I practice it uh, daily. So whenever I have guests, I'm I'm cooking Indian food oh, nowadays. Amazing, and also for myself. <laughs> I would I would love to go to Hungary and pay you a visit at some point if. Well, whenever you are here, you can test. Uh, well, I'm not sure to Indian people it would be so so Indian, <laughs> authentic. But uh, but also Leon's uh, father gave me a very beautiful Indian uh, uh, lunch, so mm -hmm. that was also amazing. I just love very much the spices and uh, the simplicity in some way of the cooking of Indian food. Right, right. Amazing. By the way, talking about, uh, once again, talking about Olympiad, I see suddenly Divya Deshmukh. She is a uh, young player who is also playing in Olympiad. She also joined the chat. So probably there is break okay. and in the break they are coming to see the interview. Uh, Divya, you can probably solve this position as well. This is, uh, it's quite tricky. Actually, I'll, I'll give some time to audience uh, to solve this particular moment. Uh, for me, when I first time saw this, when I saw this, I felt this was like, wow, it's such an easy move to miss. And it's also interesting, like uh, if this particular resource is not there, then white has to give perpetual immediately. There is nothing else. Otherwise, white can simply lose. This is what Fresine thought during the game that, okay, he goes rook c4, white cannot go rook e1. So there is nothing better for white to play queen b8 and queen e5 perpetual check. And what we discussed in the beginning, that uh, it's it's interesting how the process is going in one's mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember exactly that I was calculating that, oh, how good it would be to play rook e1, and if it would be not the, not uh, attacked by the queen on a5, then black's only move would be queen c7, queen f6, queen f4, king b1, queen f6. Ah, but I have rook e8 and gf. Oh, no, I was also calculating it the same line with rook d1. So how does it go with rook d1? Queen c7, queen f6, queen f4, king b1, queen f6. Oh, rook d8 is not possible. How good it would be to have the rook on e1 Amazing. to go rook e8, king g7, gf, right? And then you have these lines running in your brain. And then suddenly and then, you get the solution. And then somehow you get, okay, so why can't you do it little switch? little something yeah and uh, why can't you make a move order change or something so so that that's i think uh, of course when i was competing and playing these kind of games i was never thinking about how the process is for a grandmaster how do we really find uh, amazing moves and patterns right but uh, but since then, I, I uh, keep thinking about it how how to explain it to people maybe who are not uh, 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 chess players are not such a strong chess players and but I remember I was ever since I'm also one of the most happy with this game it's in in my well probably top 10 collection in uh, sure best game sure sure I'll just because of the unexpected ideas I'll quickly explain to the audience like okay uh, you want your rook uh, somewhere here obviously so this square is controlled 
the most obvious move that comes into mind is rook f1 it would be winning it would be winning uh because rook d8 is threatened but only there is queen f4 check and then suddenly it's not winning anymore queens get exchanged and black has a square to hide his king so both rook e1 rook d1 does not work uh bishop e6 can be played but i think it is also running into uh, queen c7 so the idea is very uh once you spot it it's very simple but it's very elegant why it doesn't activate the rook immediately keeping both the options open and plays queen f6 uh first uh, okay just to gain some 30 seconds and now well, this, I le this i learned from karpov to make a repetition moves just in case yes <laughs> <laughs> no matter what <laughs> exactly and now rook d1 is threatened to get here so it's possible uh black will try for the same idea and now the trick comes now white doesn't go to d1 but he goes to e1 so now if check we move and after take here since the rook is not on d1 this square is uh uh, queen is controlling d8, but there is a move rook e8 check. And this rook hangs. Such such a tricky line. I mean, to understand, uh, you need the e8 square so to play a non-committal move. And then it's completely winning. No queen, a, no queen f4 check. And Judith, as you mentioned, the details, yeah? Like, uh, in your life, in your games, the small details makes huge difference. Uh, Absolutely. I'll just take uh, two more games. I mean, two more positions. This one is also my favorite. Uh, once again, let me tell uh, to all the audience that uh, if, in case you have not got uh, these three books, please go ahead and buy it. I mean, this is available online. And you will see some fascinating uh, games, some amazing photos. Uh, <clears throat> I showed some of the photos here also. Uh, and uh, lots of stories. It, uh, this is like a must-read book for all, all players who wants to improve at any rating <laughs> level. It doesn't matter what rating level you have. So Thank you. So this one, I'll, I'll quickly go through. Uh, so uh, this was a classical time control or rapid? Absolutely, it was in Buenos Aires, 2000. I won the tournament at the end, uh -huh. but uh, absolutely, it was uh, it was a classical game. Classical game, yeah. And this again shows why they call you lioness. You are absolutely fearless. It doesn't matter against whom you are playing. Knight d5. Okay, this one is technically not a sacrifice yet because if white takes, uh, there is no way white can stop uh, b4. So knight d5 is understandable. Karpo played bishop b2. And this is how Judith always played uh, no matter who is the opposition. It doesn't matter, you know, if uh, such a legendary player Karpo is playing against her. Yeah, here black has a uh, compensation with the bishop pair and next move is also very important after the queen's only move to b1 to open up the diagonal for the a6 uh, bishop. Mm -hmm. So possibly to go bishop d3, rook c2, but uh, generally the plan was to go queen b6. Right, so and, uh, bishop d3 was stopped. And also now... so. Yes. Yeah, bishop f6 was the preparation of my next move. Right. Now white is uh, a whole rook up. But basically, uh, black spawns are dominating. Yeah, I think here white had to take f takes e4 first. Mm -hmm. But he went knight uh, c2. But black is fine, so black has a full compensation. Yeah. Yeah, this is quite unusual. I didn't have too many games like this where I had such a pawn phalanx. Yeah. 
Okay, the game ended in a draw because uh, Karpov uh, at some point realized that um, he has to liquid it. I just yeah. went very fast. Uh, later, uh, people can also see it uh, a bit slowly. Uh, just one more game I would like to uh, get. Uh, not this one. This is pretty famous. Well, this one I don't <laughs> want to miss because... Uh, this is the only game I could uh, I could find uh, which was not uh, in, uh, in 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 which was not mentioned in the book. And uh, actually, I was thinking to include it. Yeah. I was thinking to include it, and maybe I will be using it one of my articles. Sorry to interrupt, but it, I have uh, the same uh, same idea I played against Topalov, which is actually in the book right. where I made my king march. Right, but. Uh, yeah, I think it was not. A, I did not play the perfect uh, moves, and then somehow it did not get into the book. <laughs> right. But I remember I was happy with this game. Yeah, yeah. This was uh, also this was our first and only meeting. That's the only game we played. Uh, this was in World Team Championship uh, China. I remember I started very badly. I lost to uh, first round. I lost to you. Then second round I lost to mm -hmm. Ma second round I lost to Mamedarov. But then I had a good. But more or less decent run. I made few draws, and uh, last round I had a very good game against Swidler, and I won. So, and also mm -hmm. uh, that was more or less, I think, the first time India managed to defeat Russia. Ah, so, okay. Yeah. All right. Very quickly, That's I'll just story, very quickly I'll just show the game. Uh, here, Judith came up with a plan. So essentially, she wants to play g5, and targeting here. Her first move, I did not uh, expect what is going on. But the moment she played this, now I realized what is happening. This king is hiding on a6. Okay, some repetition. <clears throat> and even now, okay, still here I felt my position is pretty solid. But now the next phase of maneuver starts. I think I should have kept my rook on b1. Yes, but probably you can uh, you can save it. It just somehow I managed to to make a setup where uh, things worked out for me. Uh, yes, and also I think it's always like this, right? Like you sort of create pressure, and at some point uh, opponent might uh, collapse. I mean, if you would not but do this, I think you... sorry. Yeah. I think you had also run out of time, isn't it? Correct, correct. I think you were long time. Yeah, yeah. When you when you broke the position finally, then I was uh, very low on time. Uh, well, with computer, uh, it's uh, computer even think this position is fine. It's possible to hold, but uh, mm -hmm. in in such short time, it's also very easy to play from uh, black side in general. Yeah, I just very quickly uh, went through this game. I, you know, actually, I uh, recently uh, made a YouTube sh uh, show where I show where I analyze this particular game uh, to show uh, show the strategy. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought it was uh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, these kind of things. Of course, it happens not so often that you have the time to move your king all over to make a journey <laughs> from the king side to the yeah. queen side. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we should definitely talk a little bit about uh, these people, uh, Gustav and uh, your son uh, Oliver, your daughter Hannah. Uh, I, I, I don't remember. I think this also, this particular photo also came in New Inches, or I saw it uh, in some magazine where you are giving this look like as if you are trying to teach him some chess, and he is at the moment he is not at all interested. Do they play chess? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, I I like to say that well, my kids started early to play chess, more or less than I did, but they retired much faster. Right. They uh, did find the. Uh, they even competed in a few tournaments, to be honest. Hanna also and Oliver. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was also kind of strange for them to play when I was visiting. I was going with them to the tournament time to time. And of course, the people have uh, great expectations because they are my kids. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, people were uh, were imagining things which they did not have the knowledge of and uh, and it was not uh, necessarily so nice for them as i didn't make uh, serious training for them only they were like playing a little chess with the coach and uh, in school so they were uh, not having such a serious knowledge of chess and um, yeah as you can see when he was uh, here i think he's like year and a half or something mm -hmm. Uh, he was more uh, playing with it as a pacifier, not as a chess piece. Right, right. Judith, uh, <laughs> you, you told uh, that sometimes, you know, uh, people ask you what should uh, women do or players do to improve and uh, you feel that it should start at early age and sometimes it's too late. But nevertheless, if, uh, if we want to ask you that uh, how a player should improve, uh, even if it is slightly late, what, what is the way out? First of all, I think it's uh, it's very different the preparation and improving uh, nowadays and the opportunities than it was uh, back when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was having my chessboard. I was always sitting with someone on the other side, my sisters, my coach, analyzing, uh, polishing my intuition by having a lot of trainings. Mm -hmm. And for example, intuition itself, I think it has a uh, completely... Uh, different meaning right now. For example, in openings, I just simply don't believe that you use your intuition so much. You switch on your computer, you see the games, and you make your preparation accordingly, right? Right. Because nowadays you can say that the computer engine suggests a move. You don't say anymore when human being was telling such a move. I remember when I was saying some strange moves, and people say, no, 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 we are not going to look at this line because this cannot be good. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you don't have such a uh, talks right because yeah. you just switch on uh, one of the engines and you know that it makes sense right so so this is something in opening preparation is completely different uh, i would suggest uh, generally of course when you go on a very high level opening is very important and and but in all level opening middle game and end game is important i think the only difference is that when you're on a lower level you should be paying attention and opening maybe 15% middle game, uh, 40% and the rest is for the end games. But you always have to pay attention on all three parts of the game. Opening pre preparation also must be partly that you look uh, uh, great model games in that opening. Just pick up uh, the best games of the experts in that game. If you look at Sicilian, you can uh, look uh, in Nydorf, take a look at Gelfand's game, right? If right. you want to play Berlin, take a look at uh, Karyakin and Kramnik's game. If you want to play French, I mean, you, you yeah, can yeah. see all the openings, right? Uh, which you, if you want to play Karokan, take a look at older games by Karpov. And if you want to play Knight of Knight G4, take a look at Kasparov's games yeah. or King's Indian. So whenever you want to choose an opening, make sure that you understand the middle game. And to understand the middle game, you can only do that if you just simply enjoy the, the game, you see the patterns, you understand what are the small details, why things are working out. So once you like those games and you like those uh, pattern structures in the middle game, then you can make sure that you like the opening and go on concrete uh, measures on that with your engine, with uh, your friend, and analyzing it. Uh, solving puzzle studies, I think it's essential. It should be like yeah. part of the daily routine to to start uh, not an apple a day, but uh, some puzzles a day. Do you still do it? Do you still do it? Uh, solving actually, puzzles? I I don't. I follow some tournaments and and on Instagram. Uh, actually, I follow Chessbase India. I like it very much. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that uh, Shaq is putting uh, some studies. So when I just wake up and I see some uh, mm -hmm. studies mm -hmm. or I have some friends uh, sending over some studies and then I try to solve it, I'm, I'm, my head is still working, uh, so I'm happy. And uh, so puzzles are very important, but of course everybody else is doing it. So it's not something that you can take advantage. It's you're just keeping the, the, the pace with others. And don't forget that end games is essential. I think that is still something that people are not sharing so much mm -hmm. uh, on the social media and, and everywhere. Still, it's kind of neglected. 
Mm-hmm. But it's one of the most important elements, uh, like the book, the the hundred must know database. Mm, hundred, uh, yeah, I also end game, right. know database game, end end games and games. Yeah, because I have I have myself a must know database which <laughs> I want to share one day, and then I saw this book came out. But I strongly believe that uh, if you want to to be a strong player, it's also worth doing your own must know database in end games for example and before a tournament to to check on that because Absolutely. end game is essential it's you're tired already uh, you're you so you have to know the ins and outs of of different uh, uh, end games like i remember when i was uh, making training games with uh, almashi before my before the world cup with rook bishop against rook mm-hmm. and uh, and of course, you're not sure. Maybe you don't get it right in a game. But actually, just the next tournament, that's how I qualified that I could make 90 moves without any problem in half a minute to save a rook bishop uh, against rook. And yeah. I was only the rook. Star. Yeah. So end game is definitely something which I would uh, suggest to put uh, emphasis. Right. Uh, one last thing I would uh, uh, like to ask you. Uh, Ashwin had sent me uh, some of these uh, photos. And he also... Mm-hmm. Uh, <coughs> So I'd like to know about uh, uh, Judith Polgar Chess Foundation. I know you are a very busy person. You are promoting chess in a very big way. So if you could talk a little bit about your uh, project, how you are promoting, well, how chess is healthy. Thanks for asking. Uh, my foundation I established in 2012, and we have two core direction at the moment. One is uh, education just in education, I have my own program, Mm -hmm. and uh, we have the program running from age 4 to 10, 11, so it's like primary school and kindergarten. Uh, We are using chess as a methodology, and teachers are using it, so we give courses also, how Mm -hmm. to use the chess as skill building, as uh, giving uh, uh, knowledge for the kids what they have to learn in, in everyday life through the chess pieces, the coordinates and other uh, <coughs> things. We are developing a lot of tools. We develop a lot of uh, booklets and courses. And the other thing is the, to promote chess, the annual Global Chess Festival. Mm-hmm. And uh, this year is going to be the sixth uh, uh, event. We have practically two main uh, ideas. One is that every d- year we have it in Budapest where we have... Uh, more than 20, 30 countries from 20, 30 countries, people are visiting us because uh, the specialty of the festival, I like to show the diversity of chess as a sport, as a science, as a chess in art, and of course, education. We have simultaneous exhibitions. We have a lot of different things also for people who are not chess players or maybe it's their first event related <coughs> to chess. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that uh, I want to invite everybody who is an organizer in India or mm-hmm. elsewhere. We just open the registration for everyone. We we want to inspire people to have their own event online, offline, on the same day of the Global Chess Festival, which this year is a special day, 10-10-2020, so it's 10th of ah, October. Okay. And uh, so we are uploading all the possible uh, uh, programs which anybody is using. So it's seeable there. We had uh, what is more the, than 30 what, So what is the website? Where, where can we find this, uh, all the details and everything? It's the globalchessfestival.com and from now on continuously we are going to be uploading information. Okay. So we are expecting uh, many countries to join with their own event, which can be a chess exhibition of a simul, it can be a, 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 a program like yours, uh, mm-hmm. live broadcast, or it can be a chess lesson, or it can be anything related to chess, whether it's art, sport aspect, education. Uh, or scientific, computer, or chess, or whatever. And uh, mm-hmm. this year, of course, because of the pandemic, we are also kind of in a stalemate position. Mm-hmm. So most likely in Budapest, uh, again mm-hmm. at the National Gallery, if if we have the opportunity, even if it's only with a few hundred people, right. we're going to have a small event. But I'm moving on everything for online. So you can be joining. We have, we're going to have a virtual, virtual platform where we're going to have exhibitions, photo, paintings, 
special uh, champions talk as you're doing it with now with Man. me. I'm having uh, uh, very special characters of the chess world. I hope it's going to be interesting for all of you. And the uh, chess simultaneous exhibition, chess tournament online, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, educational uh, workshops, lectures. <laughs> Uh, so I, I tried also to make the diversity. We are also going to have chess films running for the people who are not necessarily chess players. Right. So we are making a huge work, and that's what I'm extremely busy with because uh, the online is something very new for me, and I want to make it uh, nicely and enjoyable and user-friendly. So I, I would be more than happy to everybody to visit the online festival on 10th of October. Well... Well, thank you. Uh, th th first of all, I would like to thank Ashwin for giving the link uh, so everybody can go to the Global Chess Festival and uh, uh, join the, and prepare for this 10th of October uh, festival. And uh, Judith, thanks a lot. Despite your busy schedule, you gave so much time. And I had uh, we all had lovely time talking to you, going through your games. I wish we could get more time, but I know you are very busy with a lot of things. It was uh, wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much and for the audience and congratulations for you to running this show. It's, uh, I'm really amazed how in India there are so many initiatives during the, the pandemics. Right. So I think, uh, I think chess is rock, chess rocks online. I believe in that and chess is something that we should be sharing uh, this way and much more uh, on chess. And I think you, you give a great value to the chess community so thanks very much for thank having you. me also thank you so much thank you so much take care have a nice bye. day have a nice day bye bye you too uh hi uh, thanks guys uh, for watching uh sorry i could not take any uh any audience question today uh basically uh, we had uh, very little time and there were so many things that uh, we wanted to discuss and uh, go through the games. Uh, and also, yeah, I when we fixed this, uh, uh, the chess Olympiad schedule was not out, so there was there was no way I could uh, I could change this. And uh, yeah, sorry about that. And now it's a, now we should all go and watch uh, the chess Olympiad. Uh, but before that, I just want to show one thing. Uh, tomorrow at 7.30 p.m., uh, my very good friend Peter Leko, uh, he will be joining. So, and that, that's definitely not clashing with Olympiad. So, please do join for uh, the Leko show. It is going to be very interesting. And, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, time to watch Olympiad, guys. Let's hope India wins all matches today also. Bye-bye.